should we start yes so very good evening to all and a very warm welcome uh, to the fifth uh, of the series of uh, the webinar series on research methodologies from icog and uh, it is it's our now a tradition to always appreciate and thank dr uh, Uh, Lakshmi for having taken this up, very important uh, uh, step and uh, area of uh, research, and that is training. So uh, today uh, we are going to uh, again focus on one as this is the part two of systematic reviews, and uh, the focus is going to be on the critical appraisal of literature, how to write a protocol, and the report writing. so uh, we are very happy to have the support of dr rishikesh pai who is the foxy president uh, dr geeta balsarkar who is the editor in chief chief of the jogi uh, the journal of organ gynae uh, of india then we have dr suvarna khajankar who is the professor and head uh, uh, department uh, department of organ gynae and consultant in endocrinology and gynecologist of the bombay hospital and she uh, who is the deputy general secretary general foxy 2021 23 and we have none other than dr lakshmi shikhande who is the uh, icog chairperson today and uh, we are uh, a few words from you dr lakshmi please thank you thank you so much radhika i am really happy that this type foxy icog and jogi we all have come on one platform to start this foxy icog jogi research methodology web series and i am so happy that the convener for this web series dr a g radhika has come out with a wonderful module and today is the fifth module where she already said that today we are covering systematic part review part 2 so i take this opportunity to welcome our speakers dr ridwan and dr jayshree on behalf of icog and i also would like to welcome our chairpersons dr sampath dr sindhu dr gauri dr ramprasad de dr sn basu and dr manisha beck and i welcome all our delegates who have logged in who have shown their keen interest in learning this basics of research methodology so i welcome you all wish you all happy learning and i hand over back to dr radhika for further proceedings Good. thank you so much <clears throat> so uh, going back to the uh, slides so uh, so if, uh, this is also to introduce myself i work as a senior consultant uh, in the department of organ gynae ucms in gtb hospital and uh, i am so happy to have with me dr vaishali she is a professor and head of mi mer medical college pune and she is a consultant in critical care obstetrics at ubi hall clinic uh, at pune and uh, she is a fellow uh, maternal and fetal medicine in us singapore university examiner for ug and pg exam and a lot of uh, uh, awards to her credit and also with us we have uh, dr ranjana sena she is Uh, a chief consultant in the gynae clinic at patna former head of the organ gynae uh, east uh, central railway patna executive member of isopap uh, and has held very important positions so uh, the moderator for the day today is going to be dr vaishali over to you please thank you madam so let's begin with the first session of today's and for this session we have very esteemed chairpersons i welcome professor dr s sampath kumari ma Madam is professor and HOD at Sri Muthu Kumaran Medical College Hospital and Research Center, and Madam was Foxy Vice President in 2022, and she is also Senate member of Tamil Nadu Doctor M G R Medical University and National Corresponding Editor of Jogi. Welcome, very warm welcome, Madam. Thank you. Next we have the other chairperson, Doctor Sindhu Shivanandan. Madam is the only pediatrician in today's group, and she is a consultant neonat neonatologist at Cloud Nine Hospital, Chennai. And quality improvement in healthcare with systematic reviews is what interests her a lot. She has lot many articles at her credit. Madam, a very warm welcome to this session. And the third chairperson for today's session is none other than Dr. Gauri Dorai Rajan. Madam is professor and head at Jipmer Medical College, Pondicherry, 
Adam is also member IUGA, RCOG Associate, member UPIA, URPSSI, IMA, and JSS. And she has many, many publications and books at her credit. We welcome you, Madam, for this session. And our first session, we have Dr. Rizwan. And I request Sampat Kumari, Madam, to please introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Dr. Vaishali. First of all, I thank our respected uh, President Dr. Pai, sir, and ICOG Chair Dr. Lakshmi, ma'am, and the team, Parag, Madhuri, Swarna, Geeta, and Ashok for the wonderful program, and the convener, Dr. Radhika, and the coordinator, Dr. Ranjana. The first speaker is Dr. Rishwan. He will speak on critical appraisal of a literature. He is a, Dr. Rishwan is a scientist, ICMR National Institute of Epidemiology, Chennai. And he has been graduated from uh, Madurai Medical College and AIMS, uh, medical doctor and epidemiologist and a uh, public health expert. He has more than 120 research publications in uh, peer-reviewed journals. Uh, his area of interest are burden of disease estimation, biostatistics, and advanced epidemiology. Dr. Riswan, the stage is yours. You can take over the mic. Thank you very much, madam, for the kind introduction. I once again uh, thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, without further ado, uh, let me uh, share my screen. I hope my share is uh, loading. Okay. So yes, today we are going to talk about, thank you, madam. Thank you for confirming. Uh, today we are going to talk about assessing the risk of bias in systematic reviews. So uh, Madam said that uh, we're going to talk about critical appraisal. Both are same. So we can call it risk of bias in a more formal way. And uh, when we are talking about postgraduate teaching or journal clubs, we call it critical appraisal. Uh, a formal way of doing a critical appraisal when it comes to systematic reviews is called a risk of bias assessment, or ROB assessment for short. At the end of this session, I would like uh, the audience to attain two important objectives. One is to understand the importance of risk of bias in systematic reviews. So why should we bother about assessing the risk of bias in, in the studies that we are going to include for systematic review? Identify the appropriate tool for ROB assessment. So ROB assessment uh, is a main activity in systematic reviews and there are several objective tools available for doing this so that our life becomes easy. And since it is an objective tool, uh, it becomes uh, valid and your systematic review also is, can be verified and reproduced by other people. The results can be verified. So the pr uh, guiding principle for conducting systematic reviews is the dish is only as good as the ingredients we put into making. If we do a systematic review of poorly conducted studies, the systematic review itself will be of very low uh, usefulness. But if the systematic review uses high quality trials, very well established methods, then the systematic review will, is likely to be highly useful. So this is the guiding principle of today's lecture. When we assess the studies that we put into the systematic review and we say some studies are good, some studies are bad, then we can put our systematic review on a scale of certainty. If we are sure that all of our studies are very good quality, then our systematic review has a high certainty of evidence. If only a few studies are of high quality, then the systematic review results can be called into question. So that is what uh, today's lecture depends upon. And this is the philosophy uh, that we use in conducting systematic reviews. Uh, what is this risk of bias assessment or what is this critical appraisal? It is the process of systematically examining research evidence to assess its validity, results, and relevance before using it to inform a decision. Imagine you are reading uh, an article which is newly published in your field, and you go to that article and you immediately look at the conclusions and you say, okay, this is fine. But we never really put any thought into how well the study was conducted. For casual reading, you may not be uh, interested in so much as uh, uh, interested in the methods too much. But when we are doing a systematic review, each article has to be critically appraised for its validity and reliability. 
only then we can include it in the systematic review so this is nothing but a systematic process of critically appraising the individual articles that we are going to put into the systematic review why appraise uh, the validity of a particular study so not all published and unpublished literature is a satisfactory methodological rigor this i am sure everybody knows uh, not all studies are created equally not all studies are conducted uh, equally good so just because an article is in a journal does not mean it is sound the onus is on the reviewer onus is on the researcher to assess the validity of that particular study quality can be used as an explanation for differences in study results uh, in, in the previous uh, uh, meeting we had uh, discussed on how to use this rob in our analysis i showed you uh, something known as sensitivity analysis in which we removed studies which had low uh, low quality or high risk of bias and then we saw how the results changed so this is what this bullet point means if we can assess the quality of studies we can eliminate some of the low quality studies and we can still see the uh, effect of the high quality studies they guide the interpretation of findings and aid in determining the strength of inferences that is what i said in the beginning if the systematic review contains all high quality studies then the certainty is very high certainty of the evidence that we give is very high but if the uh, individual studies are of questionable quality then the systematic review itself becomes very uh, shaky it does not serve its purpose uh, we see time and again that even in published literature and especially in rcts inadequate allocation concealment exaggerates treatment effects by 35 to 41% lack of blinding exaggerates treatment effect by 17% and open outcome assessment exaggerates treatment effect by 35% so these are some of the points which we see when we are criticizing rpt for example was there adequate allocation concealment was there blinding was the outcome assessment done independent of those who are involved in the investigation or the trial so we can see from here that if a study is not properly conducted if a trial is not properly conducted we are likely to exaggerate the effects of the treatment we are likely to overestimate the effect and thereby falsely claiming that the treatment is effective the new treatment is effective so that is the risk we run by not appraising the studies properly the current status of medical literature everybody is aware by now that publishing has grown a very very high. the number of journals the number of predatory journals the number of authors who are publishing the requirement for uh, promotion the uh, base uh, assessment for scientists all are based on publications so everybody is in a mad rush to publish and in that mad rush quality gets compromised so this is a quote from peter morgan the medical literature can be compared to a jungle it is fast growing full of dead wood sprinkled with hidden treasure and infested with spiders and snakes so when we are doing a systematic review we have to navigate this jungle and we have to carefully pick and choose the hidden treasure and the systematic review should be based on those high quality studies rather than comprehensively including all the studies which some of which may or may not be of good quality and therefore likely to bias your results these are some of the biases that we assess during a critical appraisal some of these biases you might have heard some of these might be new selection bias allocation bias confounding blinding data collection methods uh, related bias withdrawals and dropouts related bias bias due to improper statistical analysis and bias due to poor intervention integrity this is a flow chart showing where these biases are likely to operate selection bias is likely to operate at the stage of recruitment of study participants if you recruit or if the study says that they recruited patients in a convenient manner without any uh, verifiable eligibility criteria then selection bias is likely to have been introduced 
then comes allocation into the intervention arm the control arm here if you don't properly conceal the allocation order it is likely to lead to bias and then during the measurement of exposure during the measurement of other variables you are likely to introduce confounding bias if the intervention is not properly delivered the integrity of the intervention is compromised then the results are likely to be false intention to treat and withdrawals during long follow up trials that might be withdrawals due to side effects there may be withdrawals due to uh, proper improper management of the trial so those things are likely to create biases if we don't blind the outcome assess the person who is going to the outcome in patients is same person who allocated the treatment then it is likely to be biased if the data collection methods are not up if the proper tools are not used the proper scales are not used then the measurement is likely to be wrong statistical analysis in appropriate statistics tests and the appropriate statistical methods have to be used for the appropriate study design if that is not done then it can also lead to bias so you can see at every step in the methodology if the things are not carried out properly we are likely to introduce bias and it is our job to read the article and to make a guess sometimes and sometimes a persistent information is available as to whether the bias operating or not if you cannot find any evidence of bias then we say the study is high quality if you see some information is missing you are not able to make up your mind then we could see unclear risk of bias and here if it is stated that some was not done then we would label it as high risk of bias for example blinding was done, not done the allocation concealment was not done the patients were not randomly allocated to intervention and control arm these are some of the major flaws in randomized control trials which could lead to uh, biased outcomes now i will walk you through each study design separately and i will tell you what are the tools available and what are the major headings and which went is carried out in rcts there can be several types of rcts for example clinical trials community trials uh, it might be drug trials or diagnostic trials so it is this is common to all of the following study designs now i would like to uh, bring your attention to something known as reporting guidelines you might have heard of consort you might have heard of stard you might have heard of prisma you might have heard of several other terms which are referring to reporting guidelines now reporting guidelines tell you how an article should be written whether you should mean how you should write the title how you should write the abstract how you should write the keywords how you should write the limitations what are the points that should be meant in the methods so reporting guidelines are different from critical appraisal this point many people confuse and they use sometimes reporting guidelines to do a critical appraisal which is not correct so reporting guidelines are different from uh, critical appraisal tools reporting guidelines simply help you to understand whether details are mentioned or not it may be intentional or unintentional omission for example consort statement will tell you blinding the method that was used to ensure blinding should be mentioned the method that was used to uh, achieve allocation concealment should be mentioned the method that was used to randomly allocate patients into treatment arm and control arm should be mentioned so if i simply write we randomly allocated patients to control arm and intervention arm using a random number generated then that is satisfied but it's not critical appraisal critical appraisal goes one step ahead of reporting and actually applies our mind and tells us whether what is written down in the article was actually carried out or not if it was not carried out how likely it is to introduce bias into the study results so uh, please understand the difference between reporting guidelines and critical appraisal checklists so consort guideline is a reporting guideline for uh, randomized controlled trials now when we come to risk of bias assessment for rcts there is a standard tool called the cochrane risk of bias assessment tool it has six domains selection bias performance bias attrition bias detection bias reporting bias and other biases now let me go one by one 
uh, because uh, most of you might be dealing with randomized control trials and therefore i think it is important to go through these one by one selection bias checks for whether systematic differences between the baseline characteristics of the groups that are compared so if the groups that we are going to compare are systematically different with some key characteristics like such as age gender parity gravida uh, pre existing disease diabetes status uh, or things like that then the treatment effect that we are going to estimate is not going to be correct now the risk of bias assessment tool has uh, two items which will help you understand whether selection bias is happening or not one is sequence generation and the other one is allocation concealment sequence generation refers to the way in which patients are allocated to intervention and control arm so if i say i is for intervention and c is for control did i say i c i c i c or i i c c or i c c i so things like that so how was the sequence generated to ensure that patients are randomly allocated without the influence of the investigator allocation concealment refers to whether uh, the assignment was concealed before the patient was randomly assigned so i should not know as an investigator who the next patient is going to be and which treatment he or she is going to receive if i come to know what is the next treatment in line it might bias my judgment then comes performance bias systematic differences in how care is provided or in how uh, exposures to factors other than the interventions of interest are available so this can be assessed again by blinding of participants personal and outcome assessors which means that the participant treatment the panel who are administering the uh, assessing the outcomes and those who are involved in the trial should not know what is the treatment one for a particular set of patient Uh, so this is referred to as blinding single blinding double blinding or triple blinding single blinding only participant double blinding is both the investigator and participant triple blinding is investigator participant and the uh, who is doing the analysis at uh, as you all know uh, trials usually have loss to follow up or dropouts even in long long term cohort studies attrition bias is common where a large number of people withdraw from the study for any number of reasons so this is likely to bias your study results because if the exposure is associated with loss to follow then it will seem that uh, there is the exposure is likely to cause more harmful effects it may not be so in reality but we have to see how this attrition leads to bias the point in the cochrane rob tool that helps us understand attrition bias is called incomplete outcome data also blinding of participants personal and outcome assessors detection bias so systematic differences between how groups in uh, in how outcomes are determined if you know that a particular group is receiving the new treatment then you will be more likely to elicit positive responses in favor of the treatment but if blinding is done properly this bias will be eliminated then reporting bias sometimes what happens is we measure 10 things but only two of them become uh, statistically significant and it is human tendency to report only the positive findings and leave alone the uh, negative findings or the non significant findings this should not be done that is what we mean by reporting bias all findings which you in initially intended to report should be reported irrespective of the results so this point is taken care of in the tool by something known as the selective outcome reporting how will you measure this you will measure this by comparing the protocol with the actual published paper so the if the protocol says we will measure fetal height fetal weight fetal length uh, other fetal parameters like heart rate respiratory rate and in the final paper they only report fetal height and weight then the, it means that there is selective outcome reporting which means that they found something which they did not like in the other parameters and therefore they left it out so that should not happen this is an example of a cochrane rob tool for one particular study uh, every question has to have an answer yes no or unclear so the first entry is adequate sequence generation the judgment given by the reviewer is yes and this is the 
uh, evidence to support the yes judgment. The court says patients were randomly allocated. But there is also a comment, probably done since earlier reports from the same investigators clearly describe use of random sequences. So here, the particular study that is being assessed was properly, uh, was properly conducted in terms of adequate sequence generation. That is randomly patients were allocated to treatment and control arm. Allocation concealment, no. The judgment is no, which means that they did not conceal the allocation sequence. So the doctor who was assigning the patient to treatment or control arm was able to see what the treatment is before he uh, educated the treatment. Next thing is blinding. You can have blinding for patient reported outcomes as well as for mortality. For mortality, uh, usually the outcome, blinding is not necessary, but for other uh, outcomes which are subjective in nature, for example, pain, satisfaction, these are things which can be affected by uh, your knowledge of whether you are getting the new treatment or the control treatment. So the article says double blind, double dummy, high and low dose tablets or capsules were indistinguishable in all aspects of their outward appearance for each drug and identically matched with placebo was available. So the comment is probably done. Therefore, yes, blinding was done. For mortality, obtained from medical records, review authors do not believe this will introduce bias. So the judgment is yes. Incomplete outcome data. So short-term outcomes, two to six weeks. Uh, so what they are saying is no. There was no incomplete outcome data addressed. Four weeks, 17 out of 110 missing from intervention group, nine due to lack of efficacy, and seven out of 113 missing from the control group, two due to lack of efficacy. So this should not happen. They should not uh, uh, report outcome data incompletely. They should be reporting all the outcome data. Incomplete outcome data addressed for long-term outcomes. So this is the same as before, but instead of short-term, they are looking for long-term outcomes. Free of selective reporting. That is, it is not free of selective reporting because three rating scales of cognition were listed in the methods, but only one was reported. The other two rating scales have not been reported. Free of other biases, no. Trial stopped early due to apparent benefit. So there was likely to be some other bias which led to the uh, stop of the trial. So this is how you rate each article item by item to say whether the article is a good article or a badly done article or a badly conducted study. Many a time, the answer to these questions may not be clear. In, that case, in those cases, we put unclear as the uh, judgment. Here, uh, I have given you, uh, I've, sh I've shown you an example of a systematic review where there are six studies, Sanders, Goodwin, Dodd, Cooper, Bayliss, and Barry. And the questions that we just now saw in the previous slide are listed horizontally in rows. Random sequence generation, allocation concealment, blinding, blinding of outcome assessment, blinding of outcome assessment for all cause mortality, incomplete outcome data, short-term, long-term, and selective reporting. Now, a green plus means it is good. There was no bias. A red minus means there is bias. And this question mark means there is unclear risk of bias. Now, I would expect some of you to type in the chat box for the questions that I'm going to ask. Which study do you think was best conducted? There was no risk of bias in any of these questions. Which study do you think has the highest quality? Participants, please feel free to type in the chat box. Look at the number of uh, green circles a study has got, and you will be able to say which is the good quality study. Goodwin, Goodwin. Okay. Are there any other high quality studies apart from Goodwin? Which may not be as good as Goodwin, but they are pretty close. If you had to select two more studies, which have good quality. Okay, Dodd. Okay. Is there something better than Dodd? Bailey's is close. Very good. 
dot okay nice okay the next question is which study was the worst which study was the worst sanders okay okay thank you so this is how uh, we practically look at each point of the risk of bias assessment tool and we judge whether a particular study is a good or bad quality we don't actually say uh, based on some scoring we don't use scoring to say that out of uh, eight questions this particular study answered all eight questions correctly therefore it is 100% we make an educated uh, we sort of come to a conclusion based on the relative uh, relativeness between different studies so that is why i asked you to compare if i had shown you only a few studies without the other studies you might not be able to tell among these studies which was good or bad if is one negative red uh, bad or is one even one good green circle is good so all those things depend upon context but generally you get the idea the more green points a study has the better it is compared to some low scoring studies now this is another way of representing the risk of bias across studies but here we do not say uh, study wise but we say the Uh, results by we show the results by uh, the type of bias so here you can see the type of bias is on the uh, rows random sequence generation allocation concealment blinding incomplete outcome data selective reporting other bias this is for the entire systematic review previously we saw study by study now this is for the whole systematic review imagine the systematic review has been conducted and this is the percentage of bias across all the studies now i would like you to answer a few questions which type of bias was least in this systematic review which type of bias was least in this systematic review selective reporting why do you say selective reporting just for the benefit of everyone why do you think it is selective reporting uh, let me ask dr manju puri can you say why it is selective reporting we need to unmute dr manju please uh, uh, mitali uh, whoever is there at the back end some people are telling blinding so uh, let us wait here and uh, clarify this and go ahead there are two competing answers blinding and selective reporting can you unmute uh, dr manju please yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so basically uh, the selective reporting has got the uh, longest green bar so that is why i picked that up correct correct very nice so that is what i was exact, uh, expecting the, the bias which has the highest green bar or the longest green bar has the is, is better for us we want more green right we want less red and we want more green so you see across all the biases selective reporting has the highest number of highest green Uh, longest green bar that is almost eighty percent, right? So in this particular systematic review across all studies, selective reporting was minimal. On the other hand, if you see blinding, there is very uh, very less green compared to yellow and red. It has the highest proportion of red. So that means in this systematic review, most of the studies did not perform a proper blinding. 
So uh, this lets us know, uh, this, uh, this diagram gives us an understanding, helps us understand how this particular systematic review uh, might be biased. So uh, if I want to say in a few lines, I would say in this systematic review, most of the studies did not have incomplete outcome data bias, selective reporting bias, and other biases, but they are likely to suffer from selection bias due to improper random sequence generation, allocation concealment, and blinding. So that is how we make an educated guess about the uh, amount of bias in a particular systematic review. I hope you understand the difference between this graph and this graph. This graph is by study. So each study we assess, and then in this graph, this is for the entire systematic review where we don't study study wise, we don't see study wise, but by bias wise. When you are reading uh, systematic review articles, you are most likely to see these two graphs. And I hope uh, these two slides will help you understand how uh, bias is uh, interpreted in those types of in those uh, systematic reviews. Now that uh, is about uh, RCTs. Now let's move on to observational studies, case control cohort and cross section studies. Uh, many of you must have heard this strobe, strobe statement, strengthening the reporting of observational studies in epidemiology. So as I said, reporting guidelines are different from critical appraisal tools. We saw consort for RCT. Similar to consort, there is something known as strobe, which helps authors write uh, observational studies in a standard format. So it will tell you what are the items that should be reported. For critical appraisal, there are many tools, a uh, few, here I have shown CAS Critical Appraisal Skills Program Checklist, CEBM, Center for Evidence-Based Medicine Checklist. And there is also a Cochrane tool for non-randomized studies of interventions called Acrobat NRSI. These are some of the popular tools, but apart from this, there are other tools uh, like Newcastle Ottawa Scale, Jadard Scale. So, uh, and for each type of study design, there may be a different tool. Depending upon the situation, you have to select the tool and I will show you a few examples uh, down the line. I will show you Acrobat NRSI because it is similar to the uh, Cochrane tool for randomized trials. So there is a pre-intervention, at-intervention and post-intervention section. This is for those types of uh, studies which are not randomized and not in a trial setting, but they are also intervention studies. Uh, we call them quasi-experimental studies. You might have heard this term. So for such studies, this tool is used. Again, the similar type of bias will be uh, examined. Bias due to confounding, bias in selection of participants into the study, which is selection bias, bias in the measurement of interventions, then following the intervention, bias due to departures from intervent uh, intended interventions, bias due to missing data, which is incomplete data, bias in measurements of outcome, and bias in the selection of report addresses, which is selective reporting. So most of the items which we saw will be similar, but the way in which we assess will be slightly different. So this is an example of how we do the uh, risk of bias assessment using the Acrobat NRSI tool. Bias due to confounding, we can grade it as low risk, serious risk, or moderate risk for each outcome. So here the O1, O2, O3 that you see are each outcomes, outcome one, outcome two, outcome three. So due to confounding, you can see outcome one has serious risk of bias as well as outcome three, but outcome two has only moderate risk of bias. Selection bias on the other hand, low risk of bias for all three outcomes, outcome one, outcome two, outcome three. Same issues apply throughout. Uh, bias due to intervention, um, measurement of interventions, low risk of bias in all three outcomes. So this is how for each type of bias, we uh, put the risk of bias. Uh, it might be uh, useful to uh, clarify this. Serious risk means serious risk of bias, which means we don't want that. We want low risk of bias, okay? Low risk of bias means high quality. Uh, this is the same uh, similar graph which I showed earlier. The same uh, principle applies here as well for Acrobat NRS. So here we can see Christensen 2008 and Hasselgren 1998 are the studies with the lowest risk of bias. So they are the high quality studies, whereas Zaragoza 2008 has only two green dots, which means it, it is likely has high risk of bias. 
so this is how we uh, give an overall judgment of whether for a particular outcome this is outcome wise so outcome one there is serious risk outcome two there is moderate risk and outcome three there is again serious risk this is an example to show you that even for each outcome we can do a risk of bias assessment if you are looking at multiple outcomes in a systematic review for example you might be interested in all cause mortality that is death due to any cause you might be interested in death due to pregnancy related complications then you might be related in uh, you might be interested in death due to non pregnancy related issues so these might be three outcomes and for each outcome you can separately assess the quality of the study this is an example of a non cochrane tool for prevalence studies uh, if you are interested in doing prevalence uh, systematic reviews you can devise your own uh, risk of bias assessment tool here i have shown you from uh, my own article which was on uh, hypertension in tribes so i can uh, read out the titles in which i assessed the quality clear objectives tribe description study setting eligibility criteria sampling strategy sample size adequacy bp measurement techniques response rate descriptive analysis outcome data discussion of generalizability and then finally i have rated the quality then some other types of study designs require special treatment like case series and case reports so for case reports the reporting guideline is care ca and re care guidelines the critical appraisal guidelines uh, for case reports there is one from cebm and a series there are several guides for assessing the quality of case series this is an example of the cebm tool for case report so uh, i can read a few questions did the study address a clearly focused question or issue is the research method appropriate for answering the research question are the setting and the subjects representative is the researcher's perspective clearly described are the methods for collecting data clearly described are the methods for analyzing data valid and reliable are quality control measures used was the analysis repeated by more than one researcher to ensure reliability are the results credible and if so if they are they relevant to practice are conclusions drawn justified by the results are the findings of the study transferable to other settings so if the answer to all these questions is yes then the case report is of high quality if no then the opposite is true you can do case report based systematic reviews as well that is what i am trying to say for case series this is a tool by kerry et al it has eight domains clearly defined question well described study population well described intervention use of validated outcome measures appropriate statistical analysis well described results discussion or conclusion supported by the data funding and sponsorship i am showing only one tool but there are also other tools to assess uh, the risk of bias so depending upon the situation if it is an animal study there will be separate tool so this is how we grade using the kerry et al tool davis and onik is one paper sal and sal is another paper plus means it has addressed that is good minus means not addressed bad question mark means unclear so you can see here that sol and sol is a better case series compared to david and onik so that brings me to the end of the presentation i'll be happy to take any questions or if any clarifications are required may i just add a comment here uh, with the permission of the chairpersons so uh, the uh, the the point is we had part 1 which was on the basics of how to conduct a systematic review and today we have come to some aspects of systematic review so i think there are uh, now in the audience people who did not actually uh, you know probably attend the first part of the series in the uh, the first part of the systematic Uh, review program <clears throat> so just to bring that into perspective uh, it is basically the systematic review is a method of collating the studies which are of similar types so what dr rizwan was referring to was how to basically appraise each type you know i could be doing systematic review of rcts 
it could be systematic reviews of observational studies you know so uh, so on and so forth so uh, the the point is the risk of bias or critical appraisal not only does it help us to uh, you know combine good quality studies for the systematic review but even in our day to day practice you know once you understand the finer nuances and how to identify the various kinds of biases so when we read even a journal article you know because we as clinicians are ultimately interested in gaining knowledge which translates to practice traditionally we gynecologists have been not greatly interested in research methodologies and also to understand these uh, finer aspects you know of uh, you know the, the we would like somebody to tell us and serve it on a plate and tell us what is right and just i will translate to practice but today the time has come you know because we have so many studies even though uh, like dr manisha said right from the beginning uh, we are a large country the research being undertaken is minuscule but the population is so high and we do have lot of research out there probably there are so many uh, researches which need to be basically the the publications which needs to be captured and we need to today is the time for undertaking a secondary research and that is systematic review and that was the reason for holding these uh, training programs and today dr rizwan has very nicely highlighted how to appraise these articles you know so uh, this is this was just to bring it to perspective so what i found was uh, some of the audiences after listening to the initial part uh, i thought i thought uh, they lot uh, lost the coherence to what is getting uh, uh, said so the attrition rate in the audience also started today we started with a number of 50 and we are left with 35 so i just want to bring to perspective we are not surprised with that because it initially sounds complicated but once you understand the finer nuances it has got a big take home message and i think we need to strive to understand these basic simple facts very nicely presented dr rizwan thank you so much uh, over to the chair person please uh dr rizwan uh, your practical exercise is still remaining or you have covered it no, no, that is no that is all the the question okay. that i asked yeah okay so then i request dr sindhu to please uh, give your expert comments thank you so much dr rizwan it was a very wonderful as well as a very lucid presentation often when we look at the results of the systematic review we end up just reading the Uh, final analysis whether such a, a treatment outcome or an intervention whether it is beneficial or not we don't really look at uh, on what evidence this is based on for i can give an example for example in um, isoimmunization there was uh, this uh, immunoglobulins can prevent the need for exchange transfusion but when we looked at uh, studies of good quality there was actually no benefit in using immunoglobulin so it's very important to understand and that's what uh, the theme of your lecture was today to look at the risk of bias in the involved studies and before we move on to meta analysis uh, when we combine studies the qualitative synthesis forms a very important aspect that tells us whether the studies can be combined in a meta analysis or not so this particular lecture again paved way uh, for assessing the risk of bias i want to ask you a question now cochrane has come out with a new risk of bias two tool it looks as more uh, comprehensive and elaborate can you comment on it please unmute yourself dr rizwan sorry yeah so cochrane con continuously tries to improve their risk of bias assessment tool and they try to bring in more type uh, study designs and for uh, different study designs there are different tools and this rob tool uh, 2.0 uh, was introduced a few years ago and uh, it has more comp it has become more comprehensive and because of that comprehensive nature it becomes uh, slightly demanding on the reviewer as well so it becomes a task in itself and uh, but in order to make it easy uh, there is a excel based tool which helps you uh, organize your uh, risk of bias assessment for uh, if there are many studies so if you auto if you enter the uh, low high unclear uh, judgments in individual questions you will have a final uh, summary table 
along with the graphs in the Excel sheet itself. So it is a very nifty tool that we all should use uh, in order to uh, use this ROB tool 2.0, which is very, very comprehensive and it takes care of all the things that are, uh, which need to be taken care of in RCTs. But uh, Cochrane does not do observational st studies as well as RCTs. So for some of the uh, observation studies, the tools from Cochrane are still uh, lacking. Thank you. Thank you so much. Th Thank there you, is Madam. a question in the chat box. Uh, yeah. Yes, we should take the questions in the chat box. So Dr. Sandhya is asking, can a series, can a case series of low prevalence cases be made into an original research article? Um, I think uh, she she caught on to the point which I, where I said systematic reviews of case series can be done. Yes. Systematic reviews of case series can be done. It doesn't matter whether it is low prevalence or high prevalence. If uh, the condition is rare, where only case series are available. For example, we recently conducted uh, and published a case series on coronary stent infections. Coronary stent infections are a rare event. And whether they are rare or not, they are reported rarely in literature. So we could only find uh, case series of coronary stent infections. And we collected around 70 case series articles and we made a systematic review out of it. So it is quite possible that you can do a systematic review of case series. I hope that answers that question. I don't see any other question. If uh, any of us would like to, because we have 10 more minutes to discuss before I request uh, Dr. Gauri, madam, to please give the concluding remarks of this session. Radhika ma'am, you would like to uh, so have some basic, discussion? Yeah, yeah, so basically this was about the various kinds of biases that, uh, you know, we had been talking about all this while. So uh, selection bias, the, uh, you know, traditionally all these uh, biases, I think, uh, you know, during the PG, now I think every medical college has a medical education unit. And uh, for uh, protocol writing as well as for thesis, how to work on the thesis, these basic aspects are referred to. But when it actually comes to doing, you know, how many uh, people are actually practicing is questionable. So, and that reflects in the publication, you know, once you sit, uh, you know, uh, what happens is you start your uh, uh, idea, there is a research question, you uh, develop a protocol, then you work on it for two years. When you start writing the report, one is already lost, you know. So uh, the report comes out in a different shape. The title and the report don't match. So the peer reviewer and the critical appraisal, when it gets done, these get picked up, you know. These show up very fast and that is usually the reason why so many questions get asked. And, uh, you know, so... It is a good idea to oneself start the process of critical appraisal and peer reviewing these journal articles. And it actually uh, uh, gives us the, uh, the, the required tools to write uh, one's own research articles in a better way. So whether it be primary research or it is for secondary research, critical appraisal, I think, is extremely important. And uh, so I think Dr. Rizwan has posted uh, what is the, the, the link that you have given here. There, so you have courses with the yeah. National yeah. Institute. So am, of it's a SOAM course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, I'm sure so I just wanted. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted uh, everyone to know that uh, we have a course successfully running for the past one year. It is on systematic review. Uh, I am the course coordinator. It is a completely free course which is provided on the Ministry of uh, Education's website, which is Swayam. It is run by ICMR NIE. Uh, it is a very introduction level, introductory course. It will give you the basic principles of how to do systematic reviews. I hope it will be useful for everyone. Although in the title it carries uh, the word dental health professionals, the principles are the same, whatever field uh, you uh, come from. But the examples will be from dental sciences. But you can use the same principles, the same logic, the same philosophies are applicable to uh, gynecology and obstetrics as well. So I just wanted to share that 
and if uh, any any of the uh, attendees or audiences are interested in carrying out their own systematic reviews uh, icmr ni would be much more uh, will be happy to support them in carrying out and publishing a systematic review from icmr's side i can assure you that kind of support thank you so much that was uh, a great help point, uh, dr vaishali uh, this is about the publication bias so uh, we uh, traditionally in the uh, low middle income countries we find it very difficult to get published in good index uh, uh, journals so uh, and uh, number one the quality of research the quality of publication and finally the money and because of this we don't show up very uh, frequently in majority of the guidelines that get published world over and we have been traditionally following the western guidelines so uh, for instance in oxen gynae we see the rcog acog so we ourselves had conducted a study to see how many of our indian studies were reflecting in those guidelines so minuscule less than about 10% for indian studies majority of them were in obstetrics so uh, that is where the publication bias comes and you know we are translating to practice the guidelines being given by the western countries and how much of it is actually possible for our country so i would also urge the audience to uh, please go through the who uh, site and also this is the time for us to get together to undertake the secondary research and also uh, fall into the practice you know of understanding these uh, finer points so that we get together to develop our own guidelines and protocols so in the next few uh, two series we are going to have uh, some aspects of guideline development too and that is in june and july so please to remember to join us because we need to work together on this thank you so much yeah i have one thank question you. to dr rizwan can may i yeah please do yes it. yes ma'am please go ahead yeah uh, so sir i want to know most of this critical appraisal are subjective though we have a objective protocol available and the manuscript itself so i want to know how many of the researchers must do this and how do they resolve those uh, you know those unclear aspects they put it as unclear because somebody might put it as yes somebody might put it as unclear so how many experts should do the critical appraisal of the this thing to finally uh, comment about the quality of the articles uh, so uh, thank you for asking uh, that question it uh, really uh, is useful to clarify some doubts so risk of bias there are two ways of doing it two people independently do it and when there is a disagreement a third a third reviewer then comes and looks at the arguments of both and then makes a decision or usually one person does it and the other person just verifies it so there are these are the two ways of doing a risk of bias assessment unclear uh, when there is an unclear uh, situation the best practice is to write to the authors asking for clarification this information was Individual not available in the article okay yeah and if hopefully if they respond then it can, you can convert it into a yes or no but as you know many a times authors usually are not in the habit of replying back maybe because the article is very old the author's email id is not correct and things like that so uh, we, we that is a reality that we have to live with for unclear situations so uh, can i ask one question as well so regarding this uh, very nice uh, presentation i think you covered almost every aspect of the risk of bias assessment one thing i wanted to ask supposing you set out to do a systematic meta analysis on any topic and then you realize the number of studies that you have had is uh, you know they have uh, most of them have a very high risk of bias and you have to eliminate them so ultimately is there a cut off for the number of studies you require to publish a systematic meta analysis or Uh, that will provide strength to the systematic meta analysis is there something like that uh yeah thank you for that question uh, dr manisha uh, there is no cut off even uh, cochrane publishes something known as empty reviews empty reviews means at the end of the review you did not find even one study which satisfied thank the you. eligibility criteria and then you say at the end of your study at the end of your systematic review that more studies are required for to answer this particular question so there is no set cut off but you don't have to be wary of the quality of studies before you start doing your systematic review it is a post fact uh, finding so you do the systematic review and during the process you find that there are many poor quality studies and your job as a reviewer is to report 
that in this particular field in for this particular question the studies that are available are of such quality that we need more high quality studies to make any concrete uh, guidelines or as madam said there are no indians if there are no indian studies on a particular issue how are you going to uh, make guidelines out of uh, those poor quality studies for indian for indian situation so th those are the kinds of arguments and discussion points and conclusions you will draw from such studies but please don't be uh, too uh, afraid of getting poor quality studies in your systematic review it is likely to happen but our job as reviewers is to find that out and if possible if the numbers are enough you remove the high quality studies and uh, you remove the low quality studies and look at the evidence that is coming from the uh, low high quality uh, low risk studies yeah high quality studies yeah Okay. Uh, in uh, fact, another question. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add a comment in that. Uh, we recently published a systematic review on the effect of smokeless tobacco and women's reproductive health. <clears throat> and uh, incidentally, Manisha, we could not. We found only one study, and oh. we had to. Uh, you know, it was we could not undertake a meta-analysis. Actually, there were two parts to your question. So you, your question uh, was: in case you are unable to find a good quality study, what do you do? And what is the minimum number of studies that you require to undertake a meta-analysis? So uh, you need at least minimum number of five. Uh, would you agree, Dr. Rizwan, for meta-analysis, to undertake a meta-analysis? Uh, the minimum number of studies uh, for meta-analysis is two, because if there are two studies, then we can statistically combine them. But uh, it, it, it does not have any meaning to just combine two studies. So the more number of studies, the better will be the uh, result. So there is no uh, golden rule as to the minimum number of studies which we can statistically combine. Okay. So the, during my course of interaction recently with the, the McMaster University, so they clarified to us it was five. So I am sure we can clarify this further. But then uh, uh, the point is, if one is unable to get, then uh, the answer has been already, uh, you know, uh, clarified. Uh, Meta-analysis would require uh, at least a few good number of studies to undertake the same. So, uh, you know, the uh, JBI, the, the John Briggs Institute has got a different way of dealing with it. Cochrane has something different. Uh, McMaster University could be different. So that is the way it works. And that's why Dr. Rizwan says two and I say five. So, uh, you know, th there, have, th there is a prevailing issue on that. But you need a certain number of studies to have uh, uh, actually, the, the reader has to understand the kind of work that's been done and the take-home value of the results given, served on the plate. So, so that is the issue. Thank you for clarifying yeah. it. Dr. Rizwan, one more question I have. How do you deal with the component of language bias when you're doing systematic meta-analysis? Because essentially what we are looking at is studies only in the English language, isn't it? Whereas there are so many studies who are, which are done in French or German or Chinese language for that matter. So how do you kind of factor that in when you are actually bringing out a systematic meta-analysis? Yes, yes, a very good question. So um, most of the systematic reviews that, we, that you find, that you will find have a language restriction. So if they are done by small groups of people, for example, academicians like you and me, who do not have big teams, who have a primary job somewhere else and they are doing systematic reviews on the side. So for such small groups who, with limited resources, we usually put the eligibility criteria as uh, English language articles or with a detailed abstract in English. So we overcome the problem of foreign language articles. But for some study, uh, for some study questions, it may be very, very absurd to put that language restriction. For example, if you're talking about traditional medicine, okay, most of the articles will be in Mandarin because traditional medicine uh, from China, they published very uh, profusely. So if you are going to uh, take a topic on traditional medicine and then exclude Chinese language articles, it will be, uh, the systematic review will not hold water. But when we have large teams, like if there is a funded project, uh, you have funds for carrying out a systematic review, established groups like Cochrane or uh, JBA or uh, big universities, when they have a team, what they will try to do is get the article translated by a native speaker, and then the results are extracted from that translated article. So not all of us can speak uh, all the languages. So we can, you, if, if the team is multicultural, if there is a native speaker in your team, then that person is given the responsibility of extracting results from 
uh, that particular article. So that is how we overcome language bias, but it is a prevalent problem in systematic reviews. You correctly pointed out that, and uh, maybe it, it might be a research question for uh, the future, how language bias in systematic reviews can be overcome. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Actually, as a fetal medicine specialist, uh, in our specialty, you don't get randomized control trials. There are very few. And you know the cohort studies or the case control studies don't have large numbers. So you eventually end up looking at everything that is there. And most of it yes. you find, like at least uh, a good proportion of it you find in different language. And then you don't know what exactly to do and how to interpret. Yes, yes. yes. So the, uh, you, are, you are right in pointing out if the field only has foreign language articles, what are we supposed to do? So we hire a translator, money has to be spent, or if you or you collaborate with people in those regions and then they give you that expertise to extract data from those languages. For example, Latin America, if you see, there will be mostly Spanish articles. So if there is a Spanish yeah. author, then that does the job for you like that. Even the translator, so comes, with a, the translator comes with a rider. That person has to be trained in the medical speciality so that there is a uniform translation of those articles. So, uh, it is yet a uh, developing field. So, ma'am, with your permission, should we move to the next session? Yes, please. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Jayashree has joined us. And uh, for the next session, that is the second session, we have our chairpersons who have joined us. Can we have the slide sharing, please? Our first chairperson is Dr. Day. Sir is Editor-in-Chief, Indian Journal of Perinatology and Reproductive Biology. He is Professor at College of Obstetrics uh, and Gynecology and Critical Health. Sir is National Executive Member of ISOPA and National Corresponding Editor, Jogi. So we welcome you to, this, to chair this second session. Our second chairperson is Dr. S. N. Basu. Madam is Senior Director and Head Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Max Super Speciality Hospital, Delhi. And she's also member of Governing Board, National Board of Examinations, New Delhi, and National Convener Committee Development of Curriculum of Professional Development and Communication in Healthcare, NB. Madam, welcome to this session. And our third chairperson is Dr. Manisha Beg who we have been listening to in this uh, discussions. She is professor and unit head, fetal medicine unit at CMC Vellore. And she's been trained at Wellington Regional Center for Maternal and Fetal Medicine, Wellington, New Zealand. And she's also sitting chairper, sitting president, Vellore OBGYN Society. So we welcome chairpersons to this session. And I request Dr. Day to please introduce our uh, speaker for the next session. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boisali, for your kind introduction. Uh, respected all, and uh, it is my privilege and honor to be here with, uh, with all of you and to, to this Foxy, Jogi, and ICOG webinar series of the part two and the systematic review. Uh, and it is uh, my many, many thanks to the Foxy president as well as the ICOG chairperson, Dr. Lokshmi Sikonde, madam. Now to introduce uh, Dr. Joyce again, she is from the ICMR, uh, the, the NIE, and he was passed from the as a medical doctor specialist in community medicine in PGI Chandigarh. Over a decade, she has experience in public health teaching and monitoring the research. He has more than 60 publications in years of credit. He is an operational researcher and she is passionate about teaching and coordinating online, which today we are doing. So hopefully uh, we have our, we are for lucky and fortunate to have with us Dr. Joyce, madam. Uh, for he is going to deliver how to write a protocol for systematic review. Uh, Dr. Madam, Joyce, Madam, please, and that is yours. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Day, for a very generous uh, introduction. So, may I, I will now begin sharing my screen. Yeah, Dr. Vaishali, can you confirm you're able to see my screen, please? Okay. Yes, we can. We can see. Thank you. So, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to interact with this audience again. So, we have uh, 
two sessions to cover. One is about how to write a systematic review protocol. And one is about how to write up a report of whatever you've done or how to write up this review or meta-analysis that you've done for publication. So we'll go through uh, one at a time. And I have uh, planned it in a way that we have a demonstration. Demonstration as an I take you through uh, the proposal and completed review that uh, I have gone through so that you have an idea about the steps that we will be uh, having in this process. Okay. So for the benefit of the audience, I have a few slides that I used in the part one of this uh, session also, so that we have some priming as to what we are doing here. So let us say you now have in mind a research question or a research idea for which you think a systematic review is the best way to go about. So you will first have a proposal, then you will have a protocol, and then you will actually do your review and write it up as a report which you may or may not convert into a manuscript for publication. So now this proposal will be very similar to something what we call a concept note or a one pager, a very brief uh, account of what you propose to do. Um, usually it is not more than two to three pages long. So it's, it's a very preliminary draft of what you propose to do. It still has the headings, introduction methods, and uh, it also has a very preliminary search strategy for whatever topic you are envisioning. Now, let us say you're going for funding. And if your proposal, if your proposal interests the funders, they will ask you for something called a detailed protocol. Now, this is a much more detailed document which has a complete uh, blueprint of every step of what you will be doing in your review. Okay. And then you go on with your uh, doing your review and uh, getting it out as a publication. Now, when do you start writing a proposal? There are two, three start points you may have. The first point may be there is a call for proposals and you are planning to submit a systematic uh, a review or you have a project in hand, you have a protocol in hand and you're looking for funds, okay? So if there are, there are calls for proposals for, if you're not familiar, yes, there are calls for proposals for systematic reviews and meta-analysis also. So they call when 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 people are say for example a recent example is uh, the WHO is coming out uh, with guidelines for menu labeling in restaurants. Restaurant menus need to have calorie labeling types. So they had called for proposals for systematic for scoping reviews, which are a type of reviews um, on that particular topic. And there is a funding amount attached to it. So there will be calls for proposals for systematic reviews also, not just for primary research. So you may be developing a proposal in response to that. So the first step when you think, I have this research idea and I'm going to convert it into a proposal uh, to do a systematic review, you need to choose your team. And yes, you need to have a subjects expert. You need to have a methods expert. You need to have an information specialist. And the delegation of responsibilities should be crystal clear from the very beginning. Who is going to bring in the subject knowledge about the research topic? Who's going to help you with the methods? Who's going to do the analysis? Who's going to you know, draw up all the tables and the uh, uh, stuff? Who's going to retrieve the search results? Who's going to run the searches and retrieve it for you? So you need to have this clear in your head. The next step is choosing your software. Now, choosing your software, you're not going to write it on pen and paper and certainly not directly type, type your protocol into Microsoft uh, Word as such. So you need to choose your software early on in which is this software that you are going to work on. Are you going to be working on Covidens? Are you going to be working on Cochrane? Why this is important? Because if you're submitting a Cochrane review, then you will have to go the Revman way or the Covidens way. Now, the advantage of these are that they have pre-written templates for protocols. So you need to just keep filling those each of those side headings and boom, your protocol is ready by the end of that uh, form. Cochrane's Revman also has an option to write up non-Cochrane review protocols. So it is not that, oh, I'm not going to publish in Cochrane. Does that mean I can't use Revman? Now, Revman is free for you to download. Uh, you can download it onto your... Um, um, uh, desktop or laptop and you can, uh, you know, you need a login, you create a login and then you go through each of the steps. So uh, uh, the Cochrane's Revman can be used to write your protocol and it can be used to later write your completed review also. It will be a skeleton which has all the side headings that are essential. 
Okay. So your software, it is wise to choose a software that will help you do more than one step. For example, COVID and all the steps that I've listed here, right from importing searches, screening of studies, extraction, analysis, report generation, all of this can be done within Covidence. The only thing is Covidence is either paid or you need to be working for or working on a Cochrane review to have access to Covidence. Okay. So these are the options that we have and these give you a standard template and you need not have a writer's block or break your head on where to start and what sub subheadings or sections that you will write with. So at this point, when you're starting to write a protocol, you need to have a research question which has the complete PICOT format, the population intervention, comparator, outcome, and study designs. This format and your specific objectives need to be ready at this point of uh, time before you start writing your detailed protocol. You need to have some idea about what st search strategy you will use. Like I said, in the proposal stage itself, we have a preliminary search strategy. Now, by the time you write your protocol, it has to be a very detailed search strategy, comprehensively thought through at every uh, stage. It needs to have all the elements. You need to be clear how many databases you are going to search. What kind, How will you deal with the... Uh, you know, who's going to help you with that? Are you going to have an information specialist who will help you with that and all that? And remember, this strategy goes as an annexer with your protocol, without which your protocol is not going to be complete. You need to have your complete detailed strategy, including the details which uh, the previous uh, uh, participant was also asking about. Are there going to be language restrictions? Are there going to be age or gender restrictions? Are there going to be study design restrictions? So all of this comes within the search strategy and you need to have a very detailed strategy in hand, which will be annexed to your complete protocol. This also, if, if you're applying for funding, this also helps to convince the funder that you have thought through your project till the end. Like you have, if you have envisioned the search strategy, that means you have really thought through your proposal and it's a, it's a plus point when you're applying uh, for a grant. You need to understand uh, how you will screen. Now, this question also was raised by a participant earlier just now, who said if there are disagreements and uh, how is it going to be settled. Now, all this is spelled out clearly in the protocol. Generally, the standard of practice is two people do the screening. There is, uh, If there is any disagreement, it is either resolved by discussion or a third person is already, one from the investigator team is already assigned as the third person to handle those conflicts and there is a discussion to resolve these conflicts so you need to be clear with these steps also before you uh, you know when you write your protocol the previous session was all about uh, critical appraisal and quality uh, uh, assessment now this is also something you need to be ready with a plan for quality assessment of the studies that you will be including in your Systematic review depends on whether what kind of study designs you are ultimately having in your systematic review. Your choice of uh, quality assessment tools will be accordingly uh, uh, changing. Then you need to have, uh, you know, your dissemination plan because we I'll just show you when we have, uh, even when you write your protocol, you need to share your dissemination plans. What will you do with the report that will come out of this review? That is a heading that we have in the uh, protocol. If you are budgeting now for a protocol that is going to be submitted to the funder, yes, you need to have an item wise uh, budget and that differs from funder to funder. So you need to have a budget ready. If you're not sub submitting it for funding and you're going to do it with existing resources, then maybe you don't uh, have to come up with a, a, a budget at this stage. So I'll quickly exit the presentation. So we are. I am going to take you through two protocols. Uh, one is the protocol registration template in Prospero. Now, we all understand that you need to register your protocol as soon as you write it. Now, this is mainly because this informs your peers that somebody is working on this title already so that not many author teams are working on the same topic, okay? And uh, if you're going the Cochrane way, then they have more steps here. They have, you may have to register your title and this practice again differs from Cochrane group to group. There are several subject groups in uh, Cochrane and each has a standard of work here. So some of them require you to submit your title to them, you register your title with them. And then after that, only when that seems acceptable, 
then you are asked to uh, develop a protocol. So we will go through the Prospero way, okay, so that it, it shows the side headings and the typical contents of a protocol. And registering in Prospero is, I, we, we will cover that also side by side. This is an example of a Cochrane title registration form. So if, if you have this research question in mind and you have it framed in the proper format, okay, then you contact these Cochrane subject expert groups. Like for example, this is a study on, this is a systematic review on diabetes. Okay, so we're looking for non-pharmacological management of diabetes here. So if that is the case, then I, we did a search of all the Cochrane groups and we thought that the Cochrane CMED group, the metabolic and endocrine disorders group was the perfect target of, uh, to submit our title to. So when we write to them, you find their contact, you write to them and then they ask you to share a title registration form. So at this stage, not much detail is requested. There is only a proposed title. What are you proposing as a title for whatever you're trying to do? The contact person, who are you and what is your uh, what are your contact uh, details and motivation for the review or as in what you call the rational for your review. So this will basically include some background idea about the topic that you are uh, working on. What is the knowledge gap that is there and why do you think it is necessary to fill that knowledge gap? Basically building up the rational for your review. They also ask you for inclusion criteria. Okay. Where are the uncertainties? Why do you want to do this review? What we know about this topic already? What type of studies you plan to include? What type of participants you will want to work with? And the PICOT format, you can see the population intervention comparator and outcomes. What will be your inclusion and uh, exclusion criteria? Any subgroup analysis that you are planning to do here. So not much there, then you sign it and it is submitted. Now, those of you who are thinking this is as much I will have in my protocol itself, are these people going to ask for so much detail in the title of the uh, title registration itself? Well, yes, if you're going the Cochrane way, all these, all these standard steps of doing a protocol is going to be very, very elaborate. You have to be very, very thorough. It is also very exhaustive. There is a lot of detail at every stage. There is a lot of work that happens at every stage when you do a uh, Cochrane review. So this is as much detail that goes into a title registration form. Now, when you submit it to them, they are going to review it and they are going to come back to you with a yes or no. Yes, we will take it up as a, take it up as an yes, we will support you through this Cochrane review and it can be, it will be registered with this group. What happens is then your protocol is first published. Now, after this stage, you will write a protocol. Your protocol is published. Then you do your review and then your review is published and periodically updated every two years. So this is the first step of writing out something that resembles a protocol in a Cochrane, uh, in, a, in the, if you're going the Cochrane way. Now, let us say you're not going the Cochrane way and you are going to be looking at, say, um, Uh, let us say you are going to be looking at uh, non-Cochrane options to come up with uh, your uh, 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 your uh, research idea. Then still you can uh, write it up and we will do a two-in-one job here. We will look at how to register it and also how to develop your protocol side by side. Now, if my screen is visible, this is Prospero. This is a page in Prospero that you will get once you've logged in and it will ask some preliminary questions, okay? So as soon as you log into Prospero, it is going to ask you, what is the language of your review? What is the type of your review? As in, is it going to be a scoping review or a systematic review, or will there be meta-analysis? Are you doing an overview of reviews? So it will ask that question. It will ask if you have already started your review, okay? And it will ask just some preliminary details, nothing about your research topic in particular, just broadly the branch where it falls. Is it in the humanities? Is it in medical and health sciences? So after you answer that questions, when you click on register my review, which is on human or animals, there are two options. So once you check that option, this page will open up. 
Okay. So in this page, we will go by section by section. And these are the typical headings that are included in your protocol. Okay. The first is you need to have a review title. A review title generally needs to specify the PyCOT format completely. You need to specify the population, intervention, comparator, outcome, timeline, and study designs for your uh, topic, for your uh, uh, review. Now, if you look at RevMan, on the other hand, it makes even the title framing much easier. It has a standard format for the title also for the different type of reviews. Say, if you're looking at a review of diagnostic uh, 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 tests, studies on diagnostic uh, accuracy, then there is a certain format. You just need to fill in certain words and it will beautifully frame up the title for you. That is Redman. Here you need to spell out your complete title. Original language title, which is applicable only if you're doing something in languages other than uh, English. Anticipated actual start date. Generally, you register your protocol before you start your review because you don't want to um, do something that you know you don't want other people to start doing your work or you don't want to be doing something that others are working on so a good uh, one of the earlier questions that prospero will ask is have you searched prospero and are you satisfied that there is no are you sure that there is no no other review happening on your research topic now that is something that we have to be sure of because a review is a time consuming process a lot of people put a lot of time into it so you don't want to be repeating somebody else's work so once you enter the actual start date then anticipated completion date okay now if you have a rough assumption of how many studies you are likely to end up with like i know some clinicians who are already very thorough they say we only have five trials that have happened on this and those are the those results are the ones we are going to be combining and that is one level of clarity. Whereas in public health, people like us, sometimes we end up with hundreds of studies, which we will have to review and finally synthesize. So you need to have an anticipated completion date based on your assumptions of how many results you will get. What is the stage of review at the time of registering the protocol? It's preferable you register it before you have started the review. Though some people even review, you know, whether midway, I've started the searches, I've run the searches, I will still register. You can still do it. At any stage, it is helpful to register, but it's preferable you register before you start your review. So then they ask, have you completed preliminary searches? Have you done piloting of study selection processes? Formal screening of search results, again, eligibility criteria, data accession. This is just to understand in which stage of your review are you registering your protocol? That is all. Okay, because some people may have run the searches, some people may, may even have extracted the data, whatever, just indicate it here. There will be a contact person you will have to assign, the corresponding author for the review, the contact email, contact address, phone number, organizational affiliation and web address, and your complete team members. So this is why we said have your team already set in mind. Okay, so you need to have your complete team formed already. Any funding source or sponsors you need to declare here, whoever are your funders for the uh, review and the grant number. If there are conflicts of uh, if there are conflicts of interest, then you need to specify it here. If you have other collaborators who are working on the review, but they are not in, in included as review team members, you can include them here. Now, from point number 15 onwards, the actual subject matter of the protocol begins. So you first state the review question. Again, they have given you a pointer there. It needs to spell out the PICOS, P-I-C-O-S, up to the study design and T time frame if relevant. You, your research question should clearly state this completely. Then the searches. Now in searches, you will say what databases you will search, what search stage, dates you will have, any language, gender, study population, publication date related restrictions that you will have. And uh, whatever, what you will do with the gray literature, do, will you do hand searching? Will you look into reference lists? All of this, will you look into conference abstracts? Everything, everything needs to be spelt out in great detail here. And then you can provide a link to your search strategy. There is, you cannot register your protocol without a search strategy in hand here. Like I said, your protocol should have your final search strategy as an annexure. So you upload it here, you give a link to your search strategy or you can upload it in pdf format whatever the point is you need to have your complete search strategy here 
Then 18 is on what domain are you studying? Okay, the condition or domain that you are studying, what is the disease or problem that you study? Then individually, it will ask you to explain who are your participants or population. Now, here again, you will talk about inclusion and exclusion criteria, okay, of the studies that you will be including interventions or exposure. If you're doing an observational uh, uh, a review of observational studies, then you're only going to have exposures. You need to be very clear on what interventions or what exposures. See, it is always good to have searched some studies which may possibly be included in your review and read through them to have a complete idea about the intervention and outcome that you are going to be doing um, in studying in your review. Because otherwise, you may have a very, very inadequate or unclear, ambiguous description of in intervention in your protocol. Only when you have read through potentially eligible articles, you know, okay, this is the same intervention, but they've described it in this way. Or there are these variations of interventions that I have to cover. Same for outcomes. These are the possible outcomes that I was thinking of. But I, when I read these articles, I understand, okay, there are these outcomes also that they have measured to understand intervention effectiveness. So you can explain that very clearly. So I, we recommend that you do that preliminary reading before you even start writing the protocol. So once you've written the in, in, uh, intervention, you will talk about the comparator or control, which are these groups that you will have as comparators or controls. Then type of study that you will include. Now, this is an a priori decision that you would have taken. Are you doing a review of intervention studies or observational studies or qualitative studies or case series or case reports as Dr. Rizwan had mentioned? So you have to specify what type of studies you will include, okay? Context. Now, this is where you say, in which context or what is the relevance of whatever it is that you are going to study. Specify the main outcome. Now here also preliminary reading of potentially eligible articles will help you because you need to understand that there are so many different outcomes that could have been measured to understand a, you know, a particular uh, intervention or exposure. So you need to have clarity on that before you spell out this section. Measures of effect. Again, what are the measures of effect that you will be reporting or what kind of measures of effect should have been reported in the primary studies for you to include them? Only then, if only studies that have included this particular measure of outcome, I will include things like that. So you need to be very clear. Also, what will you be calculating at the end? You need to have that clarity any additional outcomes or secondary outcomes that you will also be reporting, looking for in the indiv individual studies and reporting. So for those additional outcomes also specify which is the measure of effect that you will have. Explain how you will do data extraction. What kind of data extraction sheet you will have? What will, the way, what will be the details that you will be extracting from the primary studies? And how do you plan to code them? Code them as in, if there are different categories for a particular variable, we give them coding, right? So how are you planning to code the different variables that you will be extracting from the individual studies? How will you do the risk of bias or quality assessment? Okay, this is another thing. I think you've listened to it elaborately in the previous lecture. This is another thing that you will clarify in your protocol. Next, what is your plan of analysis? How do you plan to synthesize the data that you have? Now here again, you will have very, very specific and elaborate details here on how you plan to analyze your state uh, st uh, that study. Are you going to only describe, in which case qualitatively you will be describing the findings from the review, uh, from the uh, included articles? Will you be doing a meta-analysis? In that case, how will you assess for uh, heterogeneity? What are your cutoffs for uh, the statistics of heterogeneity? How will you combine your measures? So based on what you have specified as measures of effect here, for the outcome, main outcome and additional outcome, you will have to specify how will you pull these measures of effect across the different uh, studies? How will you be presenting them? The next is, do you plan for any subgroup analysis at this stage? Are there subgroups that interest you in the population that you have specified? Will you be analyzing any subgroups? You have to be clear. Then the type and method of review. So there are different kinds of review. Which of these suits your review best, whatever you are proposing to do best. 
which is the area of your review, which could be a disease or a condition or a setting. Again, pick one from the given options. Language of your review. What, what is going to be the language of the review? Then you select the country where the review is being carried out. Then any other registration, if you have done, for example, the Campbell or the JBI, if you have registered with them, then please provide the unique number when, that you received when you registered with them also. Prospero records also, once you register your review, your review also will be given a unique ID in Prospero. If you have already published the protocol, then give the URL for that here or upload it here. This is what I said about dissemination plans. What do you plan to do once your systematic review is complete? How do you plan to disseminate the findings? Mention that. What are the keywords that you want to specify for your systematic review protocol so that it is picked up and identified and linked to appropriate ones correctly? Details of any existing review of the same topic by the same authors. Now, if you are updating a, an already existing protocol, this makes sense. Otherwise, if, it, if there is already a, a review or a protocol in this state, then you needn't be doing this review in the first place at all. Current review status, again, mention whether it is ongoing or complete, but not published, complete and published being updated or discontinued. Whatever is the phase in which your review protocol or your review progress is, mention it here. Any additional information, any preprints available, yes. You give all these details and you submit, your Prospero registration is done, okay? You can, you know, maybe after this session, try to download some Prospero uh, records of protocols to see how they look. I will also try to show you. Now, if you go the uh, Revman way, what will happen is you will have the you will have similar uh, subheadings. Some key additions will be your plain language summary. So you will have a plain language summary, which should be a, a understandable to the common man as to what you are trying to do. So you need to put, uh, you need to edit the language in that way so that it is understandable to a person who's not an expert. Then pretty much the side headings are the same. Description of the condition, description of the intervention, how the intervention might work, why it is important to do this review. All this goes into the introduction section. These, the specific objective or objectives of your study. Then in the methods, what is the eligibility criteria? What type of participants? What type of interventions? What type of outcomes you will be measuring primary and secondary? What kind of searches you will be doing? How you propose to collect data and analyze? How you extract data? How will you assess risk? How will you measure treatment effect? How will you handle unit of analysis? Like in some cases, they may have in, done analysis at a cluster level instead of a individual level. So how do you handle that? How will you deal with missing data? How will you assess heterogeneity? How will you report biases? How will you synthesize all the quantitative data that you have? Subgroup analysis, sensitivity analysis, all of this comes under your protocol. And now, if you see what we saw in Prospero versus what we saw in Revman, they're not majorly different. They have this similar broad headings. The best way is not to start you know, in a blank sheet of paper, but instead take the help of one of these. Either if you're going to do it in Cochrane, then take the help of Revman or Covidence and start populating the subheadings. Yeah, start populating the subheadings so that you don't miss any detail that is required. Okay, so I will just quickly stop share this and go back to the presentation. Okay, so. That was about the uh, protocol. Once you've written it, okay, make sure the parts are connected. Don't write random stuff in the introduction, write something else in the objective and follow it up with something else. So tie it together very beautifully. Later in the presentation, I'll quickly give you a tip on how you can uh, do it when I discuss the report writing. And make sure there is a nice flow to your protocol as much as it has to be detailed it also has to be you know have it also has to have a neat flow from the beginning till the end it helps the people who are trying to review your uh, uh, proposal now let us say you're applying for funding then you need to be aware 
I'm and I'm giving you standard criteria for you know what people look for in your proposal when you submit it for funding. How significant is the work that you're going to do in terms of what kind of impact it is going to have or what knowledge gap it is fixing? Investigator, how good is your team? Which is why I say don't 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 whistle a symphony. This is this is not a one man's work. A systematic review is never a one man's work, one person's work. So put together a team and they always look into your background work. What work has already been done? Have you a body of work in this regard already or what kind of promise you are showing that you will be able to complete the work that you are proposing you will. Innovation, how novel it is, the approach. So how detailed your methods is written that adds to your credibility and what kind of institute your affiliations are in and what kind of work we are trying to do here. So the next is uh, the environment. And so broadly, we look at these five to see whether your um, uh, proposal stands a chance of funding or not. Now, what do they expect from you as an investigator? They expect you have some background training and we're glad that you're turning up uh, in webinars and other formal trainings that are offered either by JBI or Campbell or Cochrane. Attend those trainings. What commitment to research, which will be seen from your publication profile and what your career path has been, a track record of productive work, previous funds that you have taken, which is not to say that you know, you a first time person cannot get this funding. I'm just saying that it's always good to have a, a body of work before you go big. Market yourself well, position your team in a, in a way that it is convincing to the funders. You know, tell the funder about previous publications that you have in that particular area in which you're proposing your systematic review. It takes at least two to three months, maybe four to six months is an exaggeration. If you're very efficient, it takes two to three months to put together a nice protocol. So work, start ahead. And we saw the details. Now, any primary study itself needs a lot of details that have to go into the protocol. But here, being a systematic review, you need to put a lot of effort into it. So allow yourself enough time to um, you know, uh, write a proper protocol. It also helps if you have the list of tasks and team members who are to, supposed to do each of the tasks and with timelines. So uh, that was the demo and uh, this thing I want, uh, the content that I wanted to uh, share with you for protocol writing. So now we will go to the report writing part of it. Now, let us say you, you registered your protocol and you were able to conduct your uh, review. And uh, now you are in a stage where the review, the systematic review and the meta-analysis are complete and you have the results in hand and you're beginning to write your report, okay? Let's quickly go through the uh, uh, some tips on that. So it's not going to be very different from the usual IMRD structure that we generally use for any other uh, study design. So it will be the same IMRD structure with some additions and deletions here and there. So basically your introduction needs to tell why did you start off with this particular work or and try to establish the rationale of why there was a need to do whatever you did. Methods, what did you do? So this portion reflects on the credibility of whatever you have uh, done. Results, what did you find? And discussion, you finally wrap it up with saying, what it all means and what it comes together as and what you will recommend based on that. We'll quickly three, uh, see section by section. So in the introduction, broadly, I say keep three to four paragraphs. One, to give some background about your research topic, sensitizing the reader to that. One, uh, so that's what we call zooming in. You zoom into your research uh, topic. Then you say what current literature is there, what knowledge base exists in that particular topic, which will come to knowledge gaps. So that will help you find out knowledge gaps. These are the gaps. Then you say why it is necessary to address these knowledge gaps, which is essentially putting together the rationale for your uh, study. And then you spell out your specific objectives. Now, if you have written your protocol really, really well, if you've done a very good job in writing a protocol, then this section is going to be the same as what was there in your protocol. With the additions, if some studies have been published after that stage or some other new information or a policy or something came up in the period between 
you wrote your protocol and are ready to publish your uh, review, then you need to make those additions in the introduction. Otherwise, it can just be taken from there. Now, coming to the methods, you are basically going to explain in excruciating detail whatever you have done. Now, again, this comes from majorly from the protocol, except that now it has to be in the past tense. And don't forget to incorporate those minute details which underwent some change, some practical changes that you had to do while you were doing your review. Please make sure to enter those details also into the method section. Don't just copy paste it from your protocol and change the tense because this reflects the credibility. Now, in a systematic review, everything is laid bare. Every step of the methods is written. You're giving the search strategy. You're giving the analysis code. So somebody must be able to replicate it if he or she uses the same search strategy and same codes, they must be able to replicate and come up with uh, results similar. So broadly, we've already seen these side headings in the protocol. Your inclusion criteria specifying the PyCore, your search methods, your data collection and uh, analysis, your selection of studies, your data extraction and management, ROB assessment, measures of effect if you are doing a meta-analysis and coming up with pooled meshes, assessment of reporting biases. Now you, a sensitivity analysis also. So you need to spell out how each of these were done in your uh, study, only in the past tense. Coming to the results, you present the key findings. Again, go in the same order that you have written your objectives, how you answer your first objective, the second objective, and thus forth. So go in a order present uh, general characteristics first, then specific characteristics, then subgroup analysis and sensitivity analysis. You will have certain, again, the results are going to be a combination of tables and figures like in any other study, but you will have some mandatory tables and figures here, like your Prisma flowchart is going to be mandatory here. Your uh, characteristics of included studies, characteristics of excluded studies are going to be mandatory. Your forest plot of pooled effects, if you have done a meta-analysis, that is going to be there. And a funnel plot, plot to report uh, reporting biases, you need to have that also. So these are specific uh, tables and figures that you will have in the report of your systematic review, but maybe not in a uh, primary study that you are doing. In the results, don't try to interpret or comment on your findings. For example, if you find the pooled incidence rate ratio is a certain number, just state that, give the 95% CI and stop there. Do not try to interpret it. Do not try to comment on it on whether it is high or low or why it is high and all that, because that is what you do in the discussion. So the results is just plainly stating your uh, findings, study findings. Now, if you see the discussion, this is a very interesting part to write. You write a summary of all the findings that you have and you try to co compare it with existing literature. You also try to say what your interpretations are of about that finding, why you might have landed up with a certain pooled uh, effect size, why it, it is high or why it is low. Could it be something uh, that uh, were to do with the nature of the studies you included? Could it be because of your inclusion or exclusion criteria? Whatever. So basically, think about your study findings and bring your own interpretations of it. If you're going to simply say this compares with that, that compares with this, this is from this study, that is from that study, it's just so painful to read such discussion sections. Bring your own original interpretations which add value to a discussion. What do you think as the researcher as it is many people are not fond of reading systematic review and meta-analysis because it is a coming together of many studies this is a section that makes it interesting because there is something very original that you bring to uh, this section you give your interpretations you say why you might have had a certain uh, finding you say your strengths and limitations now these could be you know in your methods something that you were not able to do or something in your eligibility criteria or something that you were not able to cover or not be able to do very precisely. So all that please mention in your strengths and limitations. Very crisp conclusion, not more than two sentences. And those should be an answer to your research question. So if you keep your research question here and read your conclusion, your conclusion should be an answer to the research question. It should be that specifically written. 
recommendations drawing from your study findings. Don't give generalized recommendation. Drawing from your study. If there is a policy relevance to your uh, conclusion, if, there is, if it is going to inform a change in practice or a guideline, then be very specific with your recommendations. Now, this is what I said I will discuss uh, later, which is the argument matrix, which helps to tie together different parts of your manuscript or for that matter, even your protocol. This is just to understand that most of us are not fond of reading nonlinear narrations. We do not have that kind of time or patience to put together your write-up into a logical flow. So always ensure that whatever you're writing has a logical flow it should flow like a story. So whatever you write in your introduction should be followed up in the methods. Whatever you're mentioning in your objectives should be followed through in the methods, preferably in the same order. Whatever you're writing in the methods needs to be followed up in the results, again, in the same logical order, similarly in the discussion. So most of us you know, sometimes do not pay attention. While each of your sections could be very well written, if they are not connected well, then it does not come together as a nice report or a manuscript. So we generally encourage that your research question or your research topic is going to have two to three central ideas. Now fix those ideas a priori. Let us say I am going to, I'm looking at this intervention and this outcome. So I'm going to look at the effectiveness I'm going to look at the safety and I'm going to, uh, let us say, you know, it could be effectiveness, safety and the cost. So if these three things are something that I'm looking into in my review, and these three are the central ideas, you could have one or two central ideas also. It's perfectly fine. Okay. But follow them through in the same order in your manuscript. So if the introduction is speaking of idea one, two, three, then your methods also need to flow in the same order. How are you measuring effectiveness? How are you measuring safety? Okay, then you come to results. What did you find about the effectiveness? What did you find about the safety? Come to discussion. What are your interpretations of your findings about effectiveness? What are your interpretations about find your findings on safety? So it needs to have this order. This seems like common sense, I know. But very often, this is missing in most of them. More, at least 80% of the articles don't have a nice flow that makes it easy for the reader. So it is helpful sometimes to have this kind of a structure in mind. This, of, of course, it won't go into your final report. This is just a tool that will help you to structure your manuscript or report better. Please run, uh, run your uh, report through a plagiarism check mandatory before submission. An abstract or a summary, once you've written the IMRD, write up the abstract, could be structured, not structured, in case of Cochrane, in addition, you need to have a plain language summary also. Keywords, I don't think I have to go into the details of it, relevant keywords, which will help us to pick up, which will help viewers to pick up your article when they search through the search engines. References, referencing accordingly. One thing you need to remember in a systematic review is we are concerned about the studies, not the reports. So one study can have more than four publications, but all of them are coming from that study trying to address a particular question. So your referencing needs to take care of it. You can be referencing multiple references for a given study. Okay. Some general tips to make your writing better, your report or your protocol. This applies to uh, both. With, because with both, you are seeking to impress. One, you are seeking to impress the funder. One, you are seeking to impress the reviewer who is going to accept your, uh, you know, your ac accept your review. Also, the readers, the scientific community who need to be able to understand. Ultimately, it is for their consumption. Say a certain association is trying to read up a systematic review and see if they have to change a certain guideline or a practice make your writing easier. It is not our first language, so it is okay to take help. Use software, whether it is Grammarly or whatever software, delegate it to a person who is good in the language, who can help you with the writing, who can help you frame sentences better or give it to a software which will help you do it, which is not to suggest put it into chat GPT and get out uh, uh, some output. I'm just saying use tools where they can support so that you are not preoccupied with the language or your work does not get rejected just because it is not tied up together and presented effectively. Subject it, it, subject it through to thorough scientific language editing. It is not optional. 
most of our papers don't get accepted because it is, they are poorly written. It is not because the research idea was poor or the research was any less rigorous. Okay, it just needs to be presented effectively. Follow whatever formatting guidelines are relevant. And these are just six S's of scientific writing. You could be doing a meta-analysis, which is heavy with the you know, jargon and statistics, but you still need to keep it simple, short, structured, sequential, for which we recommend the argument matrix. Keep your argument strong and specific rather than spreading thin and vague. Write many drafts. It's the same as with the protocol. Review your drafts multiple times. Take peer review. Take expert review. Do not fall in love with your first draft that you hesitate to uh, uh, review it or chop off portions from it or make major changes to it because it gets better with every draft. We go up to 12, 15 drafts before we submit a particular paper. Now, that's with the presentation. I will, I will just take one more minute to show you what a completed... This was the protocol that I showed you in Cochrane, which is published with Cochrane. So here, if you see whatever we discussed as the subheadings are here. You have an abstract, you have a background, objectives, methods, references, appendices, and the regular stuff. It's not very big, some SN. So here, if you see, we worked with Cochrane Tobacco Addiction Group. So we have the background. We are saying how the, can you recollect these subheadings from the RevMan that I showed you? So I have just populated the subheadings there and it comes together beautifully as a protocol here for me, okay? So this is what the protocol will look like, data collection, synthesis, all details of the methods, assessment of heterogeneity, sensitivity analysis, how I will present my SOF table, okay? Then my references, my search strategy is annexed, the list of databases I will search, the search terms that I will use, my search strategy, everything is listed in my protocol. Now, if you want to look at the same completed review. Now, this is the same review that what you just saw was the protocol. This is a completed review. Now, here, if you see the additional sections will be results, discussion, authors, conclusions, acknowledgements and references. And these are the tables that I mentioned. So if you see, we have the results. We are saying we are describing the studies. We are telling the results of our search. We are giving them a Prisma flowchart. And we are saying, what about the included and excluded studies? Then we have a section on discussion. We did not have a meta-analysis in this case. Otherwise, you will have a huge section on uh, that and the tables and figures relevant to that. Your references. Then you have characteristics of included and excluded studies. For all excluded studies, you need to clearly state the reason for exclusion. Similarly, characteristics of ongoing studies. Now, in your searches, you will also be picking up studies which are happening but the results are not yet available. So this helps the next reviewer or next people who are uh, doing studies to look at this section and know that if I'm updating a review, I need I know I need to look at these studies which were ongoing when I was doing my previous version. So that is about it. So your results will look like that, your annexures and all that. So yeah, so that is it about the uh, report. I think I've showed you a couple of protocols and a completed uh, review report. And yeah, the time is also up. So I can take any questions that you may have here. Thank you for a very lucid talk. I don't see any questions in the chat box, but if anyone has any question. I think your presentation is so lucid. Yeah. And clear that probably people did understand it. There weren't many. I can't see any questions in the box either. So if anybody else wants to ask any questions, it was very clear, I think, whatever you had said. And uh, the way you presented with all the examples that, you know, uh, left no room for doubt or any you know, questioning. I think there's one thing which has cropped up in chat. Difference between scoping and systematic review yeah so uh, quickly uh, systematic review and scoping review when we choose to do each is uh, different a scoping review is exactly what the word suggests you're just assessing the evidence base that is available 
So you will have a search strategy, a very detailed strategy. You will have inclusion and exclusion uh, criteria. What you will not be doing is you will not be doing a quality assessment of those studies because you are not going to synthesize okay. the results reported in those studies. You are just going to give, if, if I'm asking you to do a scoping review, my idea is to just understand what kind of literature base is available in that particular research question that I have in mind. I will, I, I'm not expecting you to give me uh, results or results as in effect, effectiveness, uh, mm -hmm. effect size measures or whatever. I'm not expecting that, but you are going to give me an evidence gap map. You're going to give me a map of all literature that is available. So it helps me understand what is available and what is not available. So the key difference will be that you will not be doing a quality assessment of the studies you are including, and there will be no statistical analysis or pooling of uh, the results of the uh, individual studies that you have included. Yeah. Right. Dr. Jeshi, can I just ask you one question? Thank you for that very, very, very elaborate and yet very simple presentation. It was, it, it was quite an eye opener. I just wanted to ask a few studies. So when you said about the team that you put together, what role does the information specialist have in the in the team? Yeah, thank you for the question. The, the information specialist is generally a librarian, a lib not just any librarian, someone who is trained to run these searches someone who will run the searches actually one step even further they will help you refine your searches okay they will they will because they are trained better than us in effectively and efficiently running searches there are so many ways in which you can make up a search strategy once you have the search terms for the p i c o and t there are very many different ways you can combine them so they can help you refine your search strategy they will help you run the searches and retrieve them searches and give it to you. So this will be the job of an information specialist. It's generally a trained librarian. Okay. And the other thing that I wanted to ask was, I saw in your in one of your slides that you also try to get access to the unpublished uh, studies when you're doing a meta-analysis. So how do you go about doing that? How do you access, how do you get to access this? There's a whole set of ways you can handle uh, gray literature. There are, uh, you know, compilations of theses which are not yet uh, published. There are repositories that you will be uh, uh, searching or that is that is the main way. In uh, the other way will be if you know that some work is in progress, you can always write to the people who are working on it, the team who are working on it, because we've had experiences like that. People write to us and say that we saw your protocol and we know that you are study, your study is ongoing and we are doing a systematic review on that topic. Do you have results at this stage that you can share with us so that we can include? We know you have not published your study yet. So that kind of correspondences also can help you get unpublished uh, uh, stuff. May I add a comment to that? Uh, now we in India have Delnet. Huh? So this is a, uh, you know, in the meshwork of libraries which have been connected by uh, the National Institute of uh, uh, he, uh, the, the medical sciences. So uh, uh, we have access to major libraries and the thesis of our country. So it is through ARMED. I'm sure uh, uh, Manisha CMC Venohar has access to ARMED. Yeah, maybe I'm not aware. No, every, all medical colleges have it. Even uh, the state universities and national universities have given this access. So you must be having it. Yes, I'm sure. So uh, now we have that big advantage and also for grey literature we have dedicated sites like Dr. Jayashree said so there is grey lit there are many sites now which are available and also for the conference uh, uh, presentations and the blogs and all that so I just wanted everybody to know about Delnet which is available now in India right thank you Dr. Radhika another Dr. Narayana wants to know what may be the minimum number of articles we need to refer before writing a review article? They refer as in, okay, the one that I said, the preliminary searches you do and look at potentially eligible articles. I think that would vary from case to uh, case, uh, doctor. And you will, once you go through a few articles, you will understand. It's basically to understand the variations in way the interventions or the outcomes or the comparators exist or are being measured in different studies so that you can give a very detailed uh, account of it in your uh, protocol and you are not surprised later because in your protocol stage you are getting your data extraction form ready 
okay which is going to give exact variables that you will be extracting you don't want to be surprised later that you were not prepared to extract certain variables which are actually very common in studies that you have included so there's no fixed number there's no hard and fast rule it is just a practice that we do uh, so that your data extraction form or your method section is written in proper uh, detail that is why there's no minimum number of articles that you have to refer so thank, thank you so much uh, dr vaishali just one small thing dr narayana since he asked that question and he wrote the word review so we go back to the first talk that we had in part 1 of systematic review so we are today talking about systematic review and if dr narayana you are asking about a narrative or a literature review uh, there is a difference between a systematic review and uh, you know an expert review so expert reviews in your your own individual uh, you know look out and uh, what we have been talking about in the past 2 hours is about systematic review which is about a team of people and uh, it's been adequately highlighted the steps that is that need to be undertaken thank you thank you uh, thank you so much also, uh, sorry yes. to, uh, one yes more, yes to the previous question on unpublished literature these preprints that we get these days med archive and all those are also sources because those have been pub been published yet the only disadvantage is they've not gone through peer review and uh, been published yet but those are also other uh, sources that we Uh, uh we can look for articles and yeah. there are Over other publishers you. now like f1000 research i, I don't yeah. know whether people have heard so here what you do is you just publish you know you uh, of course it is for, uh, through uh, uh the, you need to pay money and then uh, you know you you publish your uh, thing and then the peer reviewers they volunteer and undertake a peer review process and then the indexing of the article comes in later so now there are newer ways of publishing your article so there has been a whole lot of changes i think next uh, our webinar in may is going to focus on all this uh, how to publish and the reasons for rejection of articles do join in it's going to be very interesting thank you so much for giving the insight of the incoming web series so we come to an end to this marathon web series the fifth session which was on systematic review part 2 and thank you so much uh, we would like to thank our president coxy dr pai uh, vice uh, the chairperson of icog dr lakshmi shrikhande madam vice chairperson dr parag beniwale dr madhuri uh, patel who is secretary general coxy dr ashok kumar who is secretary icog and dr suvarna and dr geeta who are who is editor in chief and uh, editor emeritus of our journal our national journal jogi many thanks to our convener dr radhika who has conceptualized this web series and which is very successful and very beneficial to the faculty as well as students and my co coordinator dr ranjana sinha who is not there today but she is always there we would like to thank all the chairpersons who have helped us have made this session so convenient and successful today's talk the speakers both the speakers have done excellent job a many thanks to them many thanks to the delegates who are attending this session religiously session by session this web series and making it so popular and the icog office staff nilima especially many thanks to every one of them thank you and, and, and do and join all, us for next session and all this faculty who have spent time with us and given us the support all the way including the chairpersons thank you so thank much thank you sir thank you thank you see you all for next uh, web series bye bye thank, thank you so bye everybody